right. So, um, well, my name is Isai Madrid. Um My approach of presentation is a little bit different. I need to tell you what I do, so you can. You need to understand what I do to understand what label you can give me. I say I'm an entomologist, but I do a lot more. So, like Alan, uh, he he ended up uh, giving a lot of background on Chile, so I don't have to repeat a lot of that information. The idea on 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 what I do is go a step back to what Alan is doing and try to focus on insects, endemic insects. In there. So, insect endemism in Southern Patagonia. That is a title that I want you to remember because the actual title is this. It's too much, right? So nonetheless, I try to bring the complications down to uh, an easy way to understand it for everyone. And what I try to use uh, during my research since my PhD is try to use compelling photography or imagery for people to understand everything that we're talking about. Not just graphs and you know scientific jargon, but actually bringing it down to the people so they can understand and visualize what they can actually learn from the insects. If you have an impact on the insect and you lose, lose coloration, there are chemicals in the water. Something like that, something simple, right? So that's what I try to do. Um, so I mean, well, right now as, as, uh, as Antonio, Antonio mentions, uh, I'm the only one doing the Fulbright Antarctic studies. When I came in 2017, I was the only one doing the Fulbright National Geographic Digital to Storytelling Fellowship. So I'm always like the loner <laughs> of doing what I do. So that's why, uh, why you understand what I do. So, um, 2017, I started exploring um, the ASN region, so all this area. So what I do is I do explorations in remote areas that have uh, hopefully no anthropic impact or um, um, no signs of historical burns. So for this project, I'm going to be focusing on Tierra del Fuego, well, south of Tierra del Fuego. So I'm going to be uh, uh, transecting Isla Navarino, and I'm going to be collecting aquatic insects. My specialty is aquatic insects. So my, my goal is to try to find what are the endemic insects, which geographical areas you end up finding them, and then you go into the lab and study everything that Alan was mentioning. How big is that? The Navarino Island? Mm -hmm. I don't know, quite big. I think it's like 16 miles across. So my job is just to go all around and look for all the watersheds mm -hmm. to find endemism. So that is at the very end of the continent. And this is part of a project that we started last year on trying to figure out what is the endemic insect fauna that you find in all the islands, sandwich mm -hmm. islands, the Falkland Islands, to start having a, a clear understanding of, of what insects are going to start populating Antarctica in the future. Did they came alone or they came with, with people? Right now, a lot of the insects that you're finding in those areas close to people have been introduced, and they're usually associated with research stations. So my goal is to try to go to all these places and try to find the endemic insects. I just happen to be good in the field, so I'm the boots on the ground. Adam is the brains behind it. I'm just, I just know how to find stuff. <laughs> so, so what I do is uh, my unorthodox approach is I do all this alone. First of all, because no one has a whole month to go out into the boonies and just eat whatever is out in nature, right? So I carry everything on my on my back. I use a pack raft so I can actually cross uh, anywhere that, that that I need to. And whenever there's logging roads, I use my fat bike. So. It can carry some of the weights. And I study all ecosystems around here. So I go all the way, try to find the insects that are repopulating the ocean. They're from the, in the tidal zone. Found a new species there, just so you know. Um, go into pristine uh, forests. Uh, uh, I try to target aquatic habitats. And then I also go into the, 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 uh, the mountaintop glaciers to try to find, you know, the jewels or the, bio, the, the biological jewels that people just don't see. That you see a bug, but it's like, you just need to shine the light here. Look, it's actually pretty. It's showy, it's not cute, but it's really good. So <laughs> what I do is, when I get dropped off, I usually find someone that is going to some forsaken fjord, and they just drop me off there. So what I do is, I just carry everything, and I try to go uh, and sample all the habitats. I try to find the habitats in which insects are not supposed to be, right? So in there, they're, they're, not, they're not supposed to be insects that are not associated with the nutrients that come from the ocean, 
but I end up finding some insects that are not supposed to be there, and that's when all the nerdiness happens, and I just get super excited and go back there and just be like, oh, you need to see this because it's not supposed to be here, and it has wings like this, and whatever. <laughs> so, um, I use a lot of equipment for the outdoor industry, so I use a, a dry suit for kayaking because I go into areas that if you put your hand in there within 10 seconds, it starts burning. So in order to do all the work that I do, I have to be self-reliable, and in the area that I'm at, uh, in Patagonia, the weather is incredibly um, uh, unpredictable, so I have to be ready to be stuck in you know, one craft for you know, a whole week if needed. And I do this uh, year round. So I get to see terrible, ugly places like this all the time. <laughs> so I try to enjoy it as much as possible whenever it's nice. So that is, that, that's a sunrise. And I try to find when insects are active. Because they have, depending on the groups, you have different insects that are active at different times of the day. So my specialty is on diptera. And, you know, Alan was, was mentioning about like, the endemicity. You know, you have like less than 100 species making them like, like uh, round numbers. Over here you have 100 species in one family. And I just happen to study the entire order. There's three of us and they leave me the orders that nobody wants to study. <laughs> so I need to understand, I don't know, several hundred thousand species and then figure out which ones of those are found here. So finding new genera, new species all the time. But from the ocean, I go into the glacial, uh, the glacial pool uh, that you saw, the glacial lakes. I start going into these places, and whenever I have some lead that someone in the 1800s found it, that you say like found it in, you know, in the lagoon. It's like okay, where in the lagoon? You know, is it associated to the rocks? To where? So my goal is to try to find those because those are the endemics that is only one representative in the world in some museum, and that is if it wasn't destroyed in the World War II, because a lot of these insects were deposited in museums in in uh, in Europe. So. I have, a, uh, I have quite a task to try to find all this stuff because all my colleagues that are on the labs, they just don't want to go there first of all. Well, if you bring them on, on a helicopter, they will go. I don't have a helicopter. So I go alone and they're always waiting for me to come back to give them all these goodies. It's like, you know, it's a kid on a candy store. So as you start getting close to the forest, you start seeing all these microhabitats in between. It's like transitional habitats. Mm -hmm which are full of life, and then you start finding endemism of, 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 of different groups. So the same as what Alan was talking about, with Chile being, being a, a, an island within the continent, you start finding that in areas, but just bring that down even more, and then just look into habitats. Mm -hmm. So some insects are gonna live only here, other ones are gonna go into the ocean, some other ones are gonna go into everywhere. So when you go into places like this, I try to just, figure out at what time they come out uh, and anywhere. So that is my setup, and I just spend two or three days trying to figure out, okay, so the insect flying from here to here, where is it going? Let me follow it, and I just you know, get lost because it's kind of tiny. They're very difficult to, to follow. So my colleagues is like, oh, well, uh, find this insect. It's associated with mosses. Where? Where are the mosses? So. That's, you know, that's me. It's like, okay, if you cannot see me, how can you find an insect? It's like, no. So it's like, oh, well, the, the literature says, yes, come with me so you can understand that this is not easy. So I start climbing the trees to see if they're associated on the top or on the, you know, on the canopy or on the ground. And I end up finding the endemics. This one's pretty well known, the Darwin's beetle. But I end up finding the insects. I start finding a population that they come together specific time to mate in, in specific parts of the forest. And then what I try to do is, I, once I collect specimens for research, I try to sit down and understand you know, the interactions in between the insects and its environment. Like, does it climb, does it, like, does it feed or not? Supposedly this insect doesn't feed, and I found a lot of information in the past four years that it does feed. So I'm putting together a whole story for people to care about this insect, not because it has crazy mandibles, but because it can actually be used as you know, tourism, uh, sentinel of you know, the deforestation, whatever it is that you can, uh, you can use this insect in, in its natural environment, you can actually go in there after getting the information of how long does it live. So that's a question. It was described in 1830s, I think, right before Darwin came down here. Uh, that's why it's called the Darwin's Beetle. 
And since then, we don't even know the life cycle of this insect. So I spent the last 40 years trying to answer that question. How long does it live? It lives in between four to six, e four to six years, depending on where you find it. There you go. That took me 40 years to figure How out. How big is it? Just big. Oh, so it's, big. So it's quite big. It's one of the, the, the biggest uh, insects on here. So then I started looking into the interactions with that insect and other endemic fauna. And then you start getting into this rabbit hole that you will never get out if you get if you like insects, <laughs> in which you start looking into that other species, how does it associate with this environment, and how it starts interacting with other species. So then you start with Darwin's beetle, and then all of a sudden you end up with stoneflies and some glaciers, which you're going to see. So that's what, what I end up doing, trying to find these insects, use photography just to show people that this is not just a pest that you find drilling into your tree. There's actually beauty within this species, and it is endemic. So that's why when you start looking into all this, all this pho photography is from endemic insects from down here. Are they yours? Your photographs? Yeah. 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 So wow. all, of this, all of this is, is amazing. So um, I found this one, for example. Um, that's a fungi. It grows in spring and in the fall. There, there's a few different species. And I found this insect feeding on that because that's what I eat when I'm in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So I don't carry food because all the scientific equipment and photography equipment is heavy enough that I just rely on whatever is in, uh, out there. And then you end up finding, you know, like caterpillars that are parasitized by what? An introduced wasp or not. So I try to rear them, get the wasp, get associations, and then I come back and reach out to a world experts like, hey, I just found this. What? It's not supposed to be there. Well, it is here. Oh, but you don't study wasp, but I have the evidence. <laughs> the scientists are out. It's like, dude, I'm not telling you that you need to do anything besides just do research. I don't care about that specific species right now. I want to do these other things. This is my group of expertise as a primitive crane flies. So um, in the phylogeny of Diptera, these are some of the oldest uh, living flies. So they date back to the Jurassic in between 200 and 250 million years ago. And Chile happens to be one of the places in the world that still exists. So when I'm talking about endemic biodiversity, we have to talk about biogeography. And it just so happens that all these groups that I'm finding happen to be Gondwanan elements or Gondwanan relics. Okay, so living fossils, if you will. So that's what I try to do. Like, How is it that this insect has been here for millions of years? They, they have to be doing something in the environment. And they're going to be a keystone species. We just need to know how it is that they are. This species, that's another one that I've been studying, that it is a, uh, it is a keystone species. It's, it's one of the first, um, it's, it's one of the insects that starts degrading um, uh, wood in, in the streams. There's not a lot of fungi or things that are going to degrade large chunks of wood, but then you have insects drilling in, making holes, degrading it for other insects to start inhabiting those those galleries, and little by little, you start getting, you know. What, the, what order of insect is that? Is that a dipteran? Yeah, so this is this is a family Tanidere. So this is Tanidere spectus. You find them in the Valdivian forest. So this is where I start finding where where do their the distribution stops and ends, and which, which, uh, which uh, um, flora they're associated with. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these insects are associated with specific species of trees, not the fagus most likely. But uh, they only inhabit the trees that have been submerged for years, no less than five years. So by the time I get to that chunk of wood, I cannot recognize it. So I know that they're associated in, like, OK, there's three different species of notophagus, so it's inhabiting this. So by going to different places, I start associating, well, you know, these are out of the three, there's two species that you find here. So I start, like, doing, you know, narrowing the, the, the host and do you also find that that um, uh, that there is endemic replacement of of um, taxa that aren't here? Like, are, are there like um, niches that a trichopteran, for example, would fill? That since there, if there aren't trichopterans there, that a dipteran would fill that. Kind of like what I was talking about relative to the catfish and amphibians. Do you, do you find that as well? Yeah, I think you and I are going to get along. Yeah. <laughs> a lot, a lot. So um, I am I'm, I'm independent. I do everything on my own with whatever I have. So I don't have a lab to do genetic analysis. But what, I been, what I've been doing with observations, you know, with a naturalist point of view, is that, that whenever that insect is not in a specific stream, something is happening that that insect is not there. So you have a lot more wool piling up 
and this other insect takes the place of this insect, but this other insect doesn't burrow into the wood. So that's why you have all this pile of wood. So when you go to all these pristine streams, like you cannot navigate like you saw on, on with the pack wrap because it's just covered with fallen trees. That is what a pristine, uh, pristine uh, uh, stream looks like. So once I, uh, this can go along. Every photo has its own story, okay? So I'm just like breezing through. This is my lab in, uh, when, when I go out in the middle of nowhere. When I know that I'm finding a specific species and I need to delineate the species or discriminate by you know, using a microscope, I carry the microscope. Because it rains all the time, I need to have my tree tent and I'm underneath doing my research. So in there you have you know, light traps, you have everything that I need in order to catch insects. So that's what I do. I just nerd out in the middle of nowhere and I try to find the insects in places where you know my colleagues are not gonna go in there, they're not gonna invest on a you know dry suit, you know, two thousand dollars just to go and pick up rocks in the cold river. But I do. So that's that, that's what I what that's what I try to do. I try to go to the headwater streams. And these are some of the insects that you find. So th this th this is a an endemic beetle. This is one of the, the predatory mayflies. This is one of the most beautiful insects you're gonna find down here. It's quite large. Those are the gills. The beautiful thing about this is it's a monotypic genus. So the family, you only find it in Chile. There's two species, two, gen two different genera. And this one, you find it in different hues. The gills, you can find them all the way from pink to almost black. So people don't see it that way, because when you see it from the top, it's just you know, flat. It is like this. It's about this. It's like the size of it. This is another one, and uh, so this is the family Graphopterygine. So this uh, this family you only find it in the southern hemisphere. And if you have if you haven't heard of the Dragon de la Patagonia, the plecoptern that lives on the glaciers, you're gonna see it because that's another group that I study. So the average size of the insect is that size. So this gives you an idea that hey, go and find me some stuff. Okay, sure. <laughs> no problem. Let me just go and find it. So I try to look for aquatic insects so you can have an idea of like you need to understand the microhabitat within the ecosystem of where you're gonna find them. This one, you find them in the white water parts of streams and rivers. So that's why you saw me picking up rocks, because I picked those rocks up, and then I just happened to find you know, stone flies and mayflies flies attached to that, and then when you look at them, the hydrodynamic, they evolve the same way that you see the hydrodynamic taxa in the Northern Hemisphere, but this is completely different down here. So that's when you get super nerdy. This is a torrent, uh, like a, a torrent mitch. So it's a diptera that has uh, uh, evolved. All those are ventral suckers. So they don't. The only line of defense is to live on the torrential parts of the stream. So they just attach themselves, and they're just like miniature cows. They just eat whatever is growing on the rocks. But now, if you end up getting uh, algal blooms or you know like didymo in this case, then they overpower these insects, and these insects die because they need flowing water in order to breathe. Uh, all those little tiny you know, finger-like projections, those are, those are its gills. And when you go into the, into the pupil stage, then they need more requirements. You cannot move them. So I start looking into what other places when I'm just like, okay, they're not in the, they're not in the river, um, it's pouring rain, so okay, I'm gonna get wet a little bit. So where else can you find them? And that's when I start looking into the vertical drops of the waterfalls. Some insects are really rare, and they're rare because they're not looking for the right places. So of course you need to rappel down waterfalls to find them, but I have no problem doing that. And when I do that, I end up finding crane flies, like flightless crane flies. So this one, there's supposed to be only one species up in Bariloche, way up north, and I'm just finding that, you know, hey, I just found it down here. I'm just expanding the, the, the range, send it to the expert, and it's like, oh, you know, there's insects from this part. So like, okay, well, just from the ASN region, you found five different species. So then how are we going to use the information that we know of the species up north as a bioindicator as we were planning? So then I have to go back, it's like, okay, then scratch that entire project and let's figure out what species are there. Why is it that I'm finding them in specific watersheds versus the ones in the north? So that's why I went back into what is it, where you find them. This is another little, um, this is like a primitive black fly, basically. So these are thamaliids, so these are solitary midges. They're difficult to find. And they don't look that impressive, but the pupa does. So when you start shining the light just the right way, you start seeing that they really are beautiful. This is a droplet of water. This is another uh, group, Dixits. So uh, these are basically uh, at, the, at the base of the mosquito phy phylogeny. 
So these are ancient mosquitoes, and you can see some, you know, some resemblance to mosquitoes. But you know, in a droplet of water, my, I try to figure out where you find them, um, how long does it take to pupate, and then discriminating between species. So I do revisions on on entire groups. So I took you from from the uh, from the ocean through the rivers, going up the rivers, and now we're going to go into uh, the the glaciers. My work is being based in the northern Patagonia ice field. So as you start going up in altitude, the, the biodiversity starts dwindling. And then when you are in the forest, the closer you start getting into the ice, it's the same thing. So when I get onto the ice, you need to start thinking outside the box. This photo is, when I go with people and tell me, well, where do you find them? It's like, okay, just think about this. Right here, you have a glacier in between a valley. So you need to start thinking about if you're an insect, you're gonna be down here and this is gonna be a valley. You don't care about that. It does influence, but you need to start thinking about it in in in, uh, in, in smaller terms, okay? So that's what I try to do. And then when I go there, it's like, well, I, I'm tired of picking up rocks. They're supposed to be in here. The literature says that you find them underneath rocks. They're not underneath rocks. So then I find holes. I just happen to go into any dark space that you see that I can just fit my head or my hand, I'm always there. And I just go to the very end of those ice caves to actually find the insects because that's where the nutrients or the cryoconite or the ground up glacier or the nutrients end up being washed down the same way that you see it in rivers towards a reservoir of nutrients and in this case it's right there. So I'm trying to find how is it? How do you get into those places? Yes, you rappel down uh, crevices or you have to go into the water to figure out are they in the water, uh, are they outside of water. And this is the glacial stonefly. So this is the Dragon de la Patagonia, the same insect that was holding on to the, the leaf, the grep of the This group uh, has evolved on its own to be the only true insect inhabiting the glaciers. So by going out and trying to understand it, there is a huge tourism industry taking people to walk onto the ice. And it's like, well, you'll be, you'll be lucky if you find the dragon and if you hear the, the devil's whip. When you are walking on the glacier and then it cracks, you hear like a really loud whip. So it's not usual. And this insect is another one everybody wants, wants to see. But once they see it, like, it's right there. It's like, hey, that's ugly. It's just dark. <laughs> what else can you tell me? We don't know anything. Okay. So, I spent two years trying to figure out life history and give enough information to people to tell the story. Like, why is it that you find it here? It's not here like, oh, that's it. No, it's like there is an evolutionary history that is fascinating and you need to see it. First of all, just look at those junctions. They look like hydraulics. This thing is just crazy. It has the mobility that other species do not have. The antenna, like the other ones you saw, is like, you know, like car antennae. These ones are just super flexible. So, it's because it needs to be in the, in the nooks and crannies of, of the glacier. So, that's what I try to do. Put together a story based on science, put it out to the people, and then work on the publications with colleagues in other parts of the book. So, uh, as I said, you know, I start thinking a lot. Uh, <laughs> try to figure out, like, how is all this together? You know, I came here to look for a species and I found 10 new species. It, it's not an, an exaggeration every time I go out and come back with new species or new genera. So, so far I have, I'm amounting to just over 70 new species, uh, two new genera, and I've only had the time to describe one because, you know, I do this on my own time. So, I start with uh, species descriptions, you know, so that's what I try to do when people say, what I, I don't believe, well, then wait two years until I have my publication. After that, I include all that information into uh, manuals to understand the biodiversity of Diptera in the families that I am the expert of. So even though I'm based here, the insects that I find here, you find it in other southern continents, uh, southern areas. So that's why you see the Afrotropical Diptera. The Minor South American Diptera is on the works. I was going to write only one chapter, but then all these colleagues is like, hey, I don't know anything about the biology of these things. You need to be a co-author. So like, OK, well, let's write more stuff. And then what, I'm, what I've been doing the past couple of years is actually try to put that in a bigger uh, framework. Working with colleagues to figure out the interactions of not only macroinvertebrates, but also how does the insect fauna they start uh, taking advantage of the nutrients in the case of salmon. 
So I'm always involved in, in uh, anything that has to do with insects, especially uh, endemic species interacting with native or introduced species. And the latest thing that we did is, this is a, a, uh, a, a book that just came out a couple, a couple months ago, because we wanted to give recommendations on how to do conservation in Patagonia. And I'm, I'm the referent for aquatic insects in Patagonia. So that's the, the chapter that we worked on. I was gonna write a whole chapter, but we decided just to consolidate all of that with the, the team that I work with down there. So Ryan Reed is a limnologist, Anna Storga. It's uh, an aquatic, uh, aquatic ecologist. So I'm the part, you know, that also the, all, all, all the insect. Christian Correa works with, with fish. So, you know, we try to understand um, as much as we can and then just put out, you know, valuable information. We we'll leave this valuable so people start considering how broad it is and how we can start focusing on specific groups. So that is the, you know, what's my time, by the way? You've just got over here. Okay, so, the last thing, okay. So I just put out my nurse signal and I just call the kids. <laughs> so what I try to do is I take the insect that you saw in my thing and then I pair up with uh, some, some of my friends to actually make 3D <laughs> models. So to bring it out into the classroom, so take the kids that story that I told you, but actually bring the insects into the classroom. And I develop um, memory games, um, and, um, a board game that the idea is teachers can actually take a screenshot of uh, on Google Earth, post it, in, you know, post it, print it, and then the kids can actually play to be an explorer. That's basically what that game is. I also bring the insects in, in um, uh, hand sanitizer, and I just bring insects mostly from Patagonia, but also from, from the areas that, are, that they're at. All this is what I do in the States. So people can understand that you don't need to come to Patagonia to understand these groups. It's like, yes, you have this crazy mayfly, but you have another crazy one here. So let's go out and let, let me show you what they look like. And you know, I end up bringing some to compare. This is the mayfly from down there. This is the mayfly you find here. So you know, get them hooked on something pretty, show them something not so pretty, but it's also fascinating. <laughs> because to me, it's the best discovery is the one that you make yourself. So kids just love it. And my my wife is an educator. She specializes on autism. So what we try to do is work with the teacher to make sure that every single kid is included into the learning process. So this is why we started developing the 3D models for the tactile learning students. So I start working with the kids. Those that like you know technology can use technology. They can zoom in and out, or they can do everything if they want. And then I go into the field with the kids, usually with the parents. As you can see, parents are not really interested on insects at that point, <laughs> the kids are. And then what I've been doing in the past two and a half years is actually do these presentations from the field. So I do a presentation, and then I take a, a, a satellite antenna and actually broadcast from the field. So it's like, OK, guys, do you remember what I was doing with the kids? OK, here it is. What questions do you have? Where it is? Oh, let me just show you with the phone. This is where you find it. Look, pick up the rock. How can I find something like that? So I take them out into the field, and they can ask real questions in real time. So that's that's what I'm doing. That's what I've been doing. I do this mostly in, in the States, because they just provide me the antenna. So of course, yeah, I'll just do broadcasts from the middle of nowhere. And the idea is to incite the curiosity and also look at the world, the eyes of a child. So that's, so now you see, I'm, that's what I do. <laughs>